Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, where it's our goal to help you become the best financial advisor possible and drive the positive evolution of financial advice. Hub24 is an ASX-listed company with over $15 billion funds under management and one of the fastest-growing platforms in the market. Neither a bank nor part of a bank, Hub24 focuses entirely on connecting advisors to a broad range of investment solutions for their clients. Discover why other advisors think Hub24 are the best in the market and access the benefits of choice and efficiency for you and your clients with their market-leaning managed portfolio solution. To find out more, visit hub24.com.au. Now... Try to kick this off once, and I forgot to record, but we're <laughs> thankfully we're only a couple of minutes in. But interestingly, we were able to cover a couple of ground rules, and you were like, "Man, just like ask me some uh, some opinions," and I said, "Let's do this." So let's talk for a little bit about uh, your view of NDIS and and your view of the role that financial planning plays in this sort of stuff. Cause, cause to me, cause my, you know, my stepdad, he's my dad, but my dad, he, um, he, he's got multiple sclerosis. He's on this NDIS, you know, he's pretty happy with how things are going there. And I was just sort of chatting a little bit earlier about uh, a team of, uh, uh, you know, a tech team that have basically built a platform for NDIS products to be, you know, services to be, to be sort of purchased or whatever, however it works. And, there seems to be a lot going on and you've done a lot of work in this particular space. Um, how's it all like to you? A lot you of know, people don't understand it, right? Man, I, um, even I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So imagine Medicare, right? Sure. Imagine Medicare. So yeah. Medicare has got item codes. So you go to the, if you've, right. if you've ever had a surgery, yep. they might have an item code for an anesthetist. Yes. They might have an item code for a general practitioner and, and, and the syringes and all that sort of stuff. Yes. Same thing with NDIS. Right. Except substitutes the uh, health stuff with disability stuff. So shower head, item code. Um, you've got support coordination, which is basically uh, like a financial planner who links you to the right products. Um, that, that's got an item code, a line item, and it's got an hourly rate next to it. Um, and imagine that you have uh, a wheelchair that's got a line item under, but there, there is like an umbrella. Um, so under each... Um, there's an umbrella, like for example, core supports would have um, all the stuff that you need to function day to day, like the ADL support, activities of daily living support comes under core support and that would have item codes. Right. You might have assistive technologies. So for example, an Apple Watch can be purchased because it's got a sensor that detects when you fall. Okay, so is it the way that it works in that uh, a client purchases, uh, let's say, an Apple Watch, and then you help them, or like as the advisor or whatever, you help them claim the money back? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the advisor's role is really like a financial planner's role. So we talk about advisor. The yeah, fi- financial planner's role is limited to saying to someone, look, you've got a disability, you need to access the NDIS mm-hmm. and you need to know uh, what the primary disability is and what the secondary disability is uh, because they will ask you that question when you call up the 1-800 number to register. Right. Um, the mistake that everybody makes and we're talking about, and when I say everybody, I'm talking about medical professionals and people who work in that kind of environment. They mistake disability for a medical diagnosis. Give you an example. If somebody's got Parkinson's disease um, and they're level, like they're on the spectrum of Parkinson's, let's say that they're, they're, um, there's five stages and they're stage three. So they need a lot of help with ADLs, right? What, if somebody asks you, what's the primary diagnosis? What would you, oh, sorry, what the, what's the primary disability? What would you say? Um, exceptional cocktail making. Uh, <laughs> 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 Have you ever um, seen the, the cocktail shaking? Yeah. Now, the other reason <laughs> I make that joke is because <laughs> hilariously, uh, or not so hilariously, but that's the joke I make with my, uh, my dad, my actual dad. 
Uh, he has Parkinson's. So oh. I, got, I got one step down with, with, with uh, multiple oh, sclerosis. And I joke about with him all the time because I have to race. You know, he's in his yeah. little electric wheelchair and I, I joke about that with him. And then my other dad, I joke about how, how good he is at cocktail making. So, uh, so that makes sense, yeah. right? It makes yeah, yeah. complete sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, you've got to laugh. Uh, you've got to make life. A uh, 100%. To, especially as a guy, yeah, right? Yeah. The last thing that these guys want, you know, cause, and, and I'm the son, right? Yeah. And, and it's quite interesting because I got it in. In, in two ways and they're both exactly the same guys don't typically guys don't want to get on the phone and complain to each other we want to talk about i actually talk more about guy stuff now with them now that they're relatively sick than i ever have in my whole life like i'll just call up and i just want to talk to them so we'll just talk about the football or whatever and i don't even really follow the football but they enjoy it they enjoy it and it. and so you know that that's so, good so, so i made a joke but um no no i get it but, but so you would say that the main problem would be parkinson's well that's what you would typically yes. come to conclude right yes. is that they really ask but that's not because the ndis doesn't it's not medicare you, when you say this is a medical thing mm. then it goes to medicare so you get rejected under the NDIS. That's so weird. And so that's why a lot of people get rejections and a lot of people like on the, on, on the news and saying, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm paralyzed, but I've got rejected from the NDIS. The problem is not that, um, the problem is form. Um, so, so what happens with the NDIS is a lot of the time is form over substance rather than substance over the form. Now, when, when you, are you talking about an actual form? Or? Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about an actual form. Right. So you need to fill out the form the way that the, the NDIA approval person who's paid 50 grand a year and out of uni or whatever and got a music degree wants to read it. Right. So now I'm being, look, th- th- actually, no, I'm being very, um, very precise with this description. Um, <laughs> Specifically, not for <laughs> yeah, no. um, yeah, This is what happens. And so what you need to write is, look, um, I've got um, a, a, the primary issue is mobility. Um, so the primary disability is mobility and cognitive, and the secondary could be cognitive impairment. Yeah, right. um, because, because what you want to look for is deeper. You want to look into what has caused this person to be disabled. Yes, we know about Parkinson's, but a lot of people have Parkinson's. A lot of people have MS. Totally. But it doesn't mean that they're disabled. Totally. They, they're walking around, they're doing their thing. Um, but then when it becomes disability related, well, what is it? So in, your, in the case of your, um, if you're a stepdad, yeah. um, it's um, mobility issues, it's con- incontinence, it's the fact that there could be a light sensitivity, heat sensitivity, all of these things. Now, that w- is what would open the NDIS up. Why? Because then there is a need for us to kind of overcome that disability by providing new services. So a wheelchair will give you legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes so much sense. Now, how on earth did you? Be- how on earth did you go from being a, a regular advisor to an advisor that spe- you know yeah. speciality is this? Well, because I was never a regular advisor. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Honestly, I, I never thought. I, I never subscribed to the idea that there is one job that you do uh, or you can think in a certain way. You sh- you should, in my mind, you should be able to be across multiple disciplines. Um, you know, if you want to pick up a, if you want to be a physician, then read up physics. If you want to be um, uh, a disability specialist, then pick up dis- disability books. If you want to be a financial planner, then pick up financial planning advisory books. The the point is, there's nothing stopping you from picking up all the books. Totally right, and 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 adding some serious value uh, to your clients. That's because- cool, man. Yeah. Uh, that that's how I got into cash flow. Is just literally, I remember a client coming in and saying, "I uh, appreciate all, you know all the stuff you're helping me with, but what can you do to help me to like today? Mm. You know, rather than sort of investments is future focus, insurance is future focus, superannuation is super. There's focus. nothing right here right now. Yeah, and I'm, so so yeah. I had to develop a uh, a service which was you know just I sort of systemized the way that I'd been budgeting for myself since you know like i was 21 but in your situation you did you did the exact same thing so you had you obviously had clients with a need and then you just went screw it i'm just going to get good i at wanted this. i wanted i wanted to have discussions with medical practitioners um and and uh, and and he- allied health professionals and disability uh, professionals in a language that they understood um, yeah. Because when you speak to financial planners, we have all these acronyms. When you speak to uh, any profession, they have their own acronyms and they have their own way of thinking and they have and they have their own angles. But if you understood what that language is, you open up doors. And so I went and I did my qualifications um, like them. 
And what do you mean? Well, I've I've done my master's in disability studies at Flinders School of Health and Medicine. Are you serious? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I, 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 I am a disability expert. I am a qualified person in that field. And so I no do. No wonder we get along. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm full of disabilities. <laughs> I, I can, I've already identified a couple. Um, but I Mostly think, mental. I, 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 I think the entire XY community <laughs> have identified. It's not just me. <laughs> but prevalent disabilities. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, and, and put your pants on, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> mate, so that's an interesting story. So I didn't realize you were that, um, that well educated in this. I just thought it was something that you'd gotten no, better no. at o- over time. Now, this, this somehow led into you, you and your brother creating, uh, yeah, so of- we, we basically, um, reversed engineered Centrelink disability support pension assessment process. Um, and, and put a technology behind it so that when somebody um, comes through the door, we're able to tell them you should apply or you shouldn't apply uh, after 20 minutes. Because what happens is that when you apply, a, a lot of these people are um, at risk of homelessness and they go to Centrelink and Centrelink says to them, oh, look, you know, here, you've lost your job. Um, you get onto the new start. If you've got a disability or if you think you've got a disability, fill out this form. Um, now they just fill it out. But there is a whole legislation in the background, and I think a lot of the listeners will will know this already. There is like impairment tables. There is criteria about being fully treated, fully diagnosed, uh, fully stabilized. What does that mean? Um, there is there is rules of engagement with job capacity um, uh, building. Like if you're in a program of support, um, there is all sorts of stuff that. A form, when you fill it out, is going to result in a rejection. But they don't reject it the next day. They reject it nine, ten months later. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah. And so, and so these people are living in hope that, yeah, I can survive on Newstart. They go and borrow money. They, they try to borrow from relatives. They try to go and hock their gold at the, uh. and so I, I got sick of it. And I was like, no, there's got to be another way. And so what we did was we looked at, um, how Centrelink was making the assessments. Uh, met with everybody from the Department of um, Social Services, sat down with them, understood, looked at case law from um, how the tribunals make their judgments, and then reverse engineered a very simple process from the very beginning to say, buddy, don't apply unless you've got this paperwork with you. Wow. And so, um, and so, and, and the paperwork has to be, you know, within a particular time period from the date of lodgement. Otherwise, it's too old to be admitted as evidence and all that sort of stuff. So wow. there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, right. Then I realized, hey, wait a minute. Even when we're doing that in a, in a technology-enabled way, even when we're doing that, um, people still need hand-holding because a lot of them have cognitive issues. A lot of them are too tired, too fatigued. They don't know what to say to the doctor. So then we had to develop another system that spits out the functional uh, impairments so we had to identify what the functional impairments are, send a do- the doctor, these are the functional impairments, this is what you need to measure, um, and then you need to report to us back and we will take that paperwork to Centrelink. Dude, that's a lot of complexity. How long have you been working on that? Um, well, it's been a journey of 10 years. Um, in, in that we had to, I had to understand all the systems and yeah. I had to understand where the issues were. Um, just put it in perspective... Seventy-four percent of all applications get rejected. Is that right? Seventy-four percent. Now, so so to put it in context, in two thousand and seventeen, there were ninety-two thousand applicants for the disability support pension. Right. Um, sixty thousand or more got rejected. My God. And so, what happens to these people? They're the people who are living on the street. They're the people who, when you walk by. Um, have never been stabilized because they don't have a, a money for the psychiatrist. Because every time you see a psychiatrist, you have to pay money. And if you're on new start, you can't be um, uh, fully stabilized. You see? So that you don't meet the criteria. So you end up on the streets. So I got sick of that shit. That's pretty brutal. Hey? Do you know what I mean? Like I, I think we all are sick of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we needed to um, hack the system. Awesome, man. Yeah, and so we're doing it now for, you know, 
like I'm doing it for $440. I know I'm making a huge loss on it because it takes hours and hours. We actually do the whole thing, including standing in center and clients for these people. Um, put it in context, I advertised on Facebook just as a, uh, a thing. We got 300 and something response, uh, responses mm, yes. out of two days for 130 bucks. Wow. And I'm thinking, because the, the demand is so huge. Uh, we had two suicide um, uh, people at risk of suicide. Um, one of them I identified through a friend of a friend. I ended up calling that friend of a friend. He called him and stopped him from taking his life on that day. And believe it or not, I was um, in my wife's um, citizenship, cer- citizenship ceremony. I'm happy to share it with you so you can have a look. But that was like, right then and there, you have to do something about it. This is what systems are doing and this is the power of financial advisors who want to help people it's one thing to say to people go and apply for a disability support pension because um, you've got a disability it's another thing to persevere with them for nine months ten months until they get it and then fight when they don't get it do you know what i'm saying that but this is the opportunity where the fba should be teaching advises these kind of skills because then the community really seriously appreciates the value that financial planners do because financial planners are masters of finance man we know we should know the financial system inside and out including social security and if you want to really try your knowledge go and help somebody with no money double dare you if you can somebody with make somebody with no money wealthy you're a true artist well, if, uh, do you know what i'm saying yeah We've been doing that for a long time. We've been making homeless people homeowners. What? You didn't know that. We claimed $20 million in the last year for predominantly people either homeless or at risk of homelessness by shifting liability from them onto, onto the uh, superannuation funds. Ask you this question. How many people with disabilities have worked the day of their life? Does that come with superannuation or doesn't it? Totally. See, we just shifted liability, didn't we? Yeah. Right. So, so we can save the taxpayer money by understanding the trends and how we can help people. Um, and we know this as financial planners. We know it. We see somebody who is sitting on the street begging for money. And we should ask ourselves, what did you do before all of this? Did you have a normal life? Did you have kids? Did you have a wife? Where you, did you have a boyfriend, a girlfriend? Um, did you work? Were you a McDonald's burger flipper? Give you this example. A lady fell six stories down. They had her as a suicide attempt. I go there and I looked at her. Her face was all black. I've never seen anything like that. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody who fell from six stories. It's a terrible scene. Um, and I asked her why, what happened. And she said, oh, you know, um, I smoked a bit of pot and, um, and I hallucinated. So I said, it wasn't suicide. She goes, no, um, I don't think it was. But because she was working for three months, four months um, before all of this at Hungry Jack's, she had an insurance policy. Um, but if, if they ticked suicide, then there would be a 13-month suicide exclusion period. Of course. She ended up getting $300,000. Now, here is the thing with that. What did she do with the money? Well, she started withdrawing the money. Every single week, I would get a request for 10 grand, 20 grand. Well, what's happening is that the service provider, the disability provider had what they call a PCP, a person-centered plan, whereby they want to engage her back into the community. So they're taking her to the RSL every second day to have lunch. Guess what she was doing with the money? She was gambling it. Now, how bizarre, right? Do you think that the service provider raised a question about this person with a disability who's got a cognitive impairment, has fallen six stories, she's got quite a brain injury. Where is she getting the money, $3,000, $4,000 a day to gamble on the um, pokies? Um, now I called the. I, I found out her local hospital. I called them, and they didn't know anything about taking financial management orders or instigating a financial um, administration hearing at NCAT. How many advisors understand all of that? Mm, no, so few. And and the question is why? Why don't we understand it? Is aren't we? What happens when our client? It gets punched, sucker, you know, sucker punched in the head, and they start making bizarre. Uh, what, what do we do? So this is the stuff that I want the FPA and the, and the FASIA and all of these people to concentrate on because that's the stuff the community values. This is the stuff that makes us extremely important in, in our existence to the community. 
And this is when we don't end up at the Royal Commission trying to defend ourselves because the community will defend us. Man, that's a, as, that's a whole different ball game. Like you talk about advice with a, with a passion that is really rare, right? Like that's, that's, that's some crazy stuff, man. I've never heard a lot of that, you know, that's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the closest thing that I got to that was, I uh, had a client and he mentioned his wife who just was too, um, you know, her mobility was at such that I'd never actually met her. And, uh, and he said that, oh, you know, we paid a, a law firm, I think, you know, this no fee, no win kind of guys. Um, I think it was almost a hundred thousand dollars to simply claim on, uh, insurances that were in one, uh, super fund mm -hmm. and, um, which was the, the main super fund that they knew about. And I think, you know, from memory, it was like $300,000 or whatever. And then the, the legal guys took, you know, a huge chunk of it. I can't remember if it was a hundred off the top of my head, but I remember it was an Big extremely time. large amount. And, um, I said, is that all of the, the super funds? And he goes, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And I said, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to call up the ATO with your wife and we're going to give the tax file number and go through it. And we're just going to double check. We're just going to double check. There's not any more out there. And, uh, and yeah, I was able to find, um, one more with, I think there was like only a couple of grand in there, but, uh, and, and there was another, I think it wasn't a huge amount. It wasn't as big, but there was like 60 grand or something. How in there. that? And, uh, and I was able to, yeah, get it, get it all done. And I think, I, I think I, you know, my FIFA service was like five grand or whatever. Right. And, yeah. and I was able to get them 60 K, you know, fantastic. Just, just like that old, old. And it took, it took, it took actually a long time because we had to sort of go through and get the medical records and everything like that. But that, like, I really enjoyed that type of work. So I can see the attraction to it. I just did not get as much to it because on the flip side someone like uh you know either of my dads uh they uh, they're the kind of guys that just don't ever want to even uh talk about it so it's it's a much more difficult topic i remember i was trying to get my my stepdad to sort of like go ahead and go through you know and claim all this sort of stuff and he uh, he just simply didn't he, he was very reluctant to yeah. and so um and maybe that's just because um you know, I was the kid that he brought up. So perhaps, you know, there's that involved, but I did find that the other people, uh, I had a little, I really enjoyed that work. Yeah. Well, and, and it's very enjoyable work. Yeah. It's extremely rewarding and it will yeah. stick and the, and the result will stick with you, um, in your memory. Yeah. As a, as a huge win, a professional win. Definitely. Um, and so, um, but we need to understand what advocacy looks like in, in the professional sense. Um, what does professional care look like? Um, and then if you claim the money, then what are the, um, capacity triggers? How do you understand what informed consent is? Um, when do you understand your boundaries to say, yeah, okay, I'm, there is a hundred thousand dollars in, like you mentioned, there's a hundred thousand dollars in, um, uh, in, in the, in the, uh, amount owing, um, in the super fund, but, at the same time, it's like, well, if you don't want to claim it, it's okay because you've got the dignity to uh, refuse making a claim. Do you know what I mean? You, you have to give people dignity to refuse a claim. You have, and it's called in disability in human rights world. When somebody doesn't want to do something, although it doesn't make sense to you, this is called giving them the dignity of risk. And it means that you're giving somebody the dignity to take their own risks in life. That comes from the time where if people are just so worried about their kids who have disabilities that they don't let them do anything. They put them like in a, in a, oh, yeah, in a bubble. bubble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And so the, so the concept is, no, you've got to allow people to make decisions even though you might not agree with them. Yep. But in a profession, in our world, it's about also uh, there is an element of rationality. And it seems irrational, then you've got to understand how to instigate administration hearings, get people involved in their life, supported decision-making stuff, like can you appoint a power of attorney? Um, do you have capacity to do that? So who can I involve? Who Can I bring your siblings or your family to support you a little bit better with this? Um, so we do that. We exhaust that. And then we go into um, uh, involuntary uh, takeovers like administration hearings and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but you've got to afford people. You've got to go in there um, fully affording people the dignity to make their own decisions, even if you disagree with them. Yeah, it's fair play. Um, and it doesn't surprise me and uh, we can sort of, you know, like uh, gloss over this, but I think it's worth mentioning um, because your background on a, on a, you know, like on a personal level, it does not surprise me that you're quite aware of a lot of these human rights and things like that considering, mm. you know, you sort of, you know, you, you, had, you certainly had a bit more of a challenging situation than, than most. We've um, talked about it uh, when we, yeah. uh, over um, over Korean barbecue. <laughs> exactly. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And uh, and I don't I don't know how much you want to share there, but it it you're happy to yeah, yeah mate. Let's because uh, I think even with, with that context, it makes a lot more of what you're talking about make just so much sense, right? The word congruence rings a bell where your life experience reflects your uh, your professional ability. So. Yeah, man. Like, uh, take it away. Um, I don't know if how many people know this, but uh, obviously you you hear my accent and you think, where is that from? Um, I'm of an Iraqi background, and I've come from very small minority um, who, uh, you know, with with these countries, you're either a majority or you're a nobody. Um, and so, becoming coming from a minority, um, that was a bit of an issue growing up, and then. Um, the Iraq War um, happened in 1992. Uh, in 1990, we le- I left Iraq when, uh, with my parents when I was 10 years old. Ended up in Libya for two years. Um, I think I mentioned to you in Libya, um, I was, uh, I didn't realize it, but it was actually torture. Um, and I was like, well, you know, what does torture look like? Well, it's by hanging from a ceiling and being caned um, and, and punched and all that sort of stuff. By um, systematically, and it wasn't just me; it was a, a whole lot of people, um, a whole lot of kids, and it was like um, it was not impre- Well, look, my my opinion on that is that it wasn't because I it was in Sirte where Gaddafi, Colonel Gaddafi's hometown is. I think it was in preparation for an invasion. Like he kind of he he needed to either harden people, break them down, get rid of them, or um, um, so it was. Uh, schooling was almost like a. Militant. Militant. It was. It was like a. It was a training ground for an possible uprising. So he needed these kids who are ten today, eleven today, to be bearing arms in, in a couple of years' time, three years' time, um, and so um, and so the the, the punishments um, didn't uh, quite gel with the with the uh, uh, you know the. <laughs> The problem that you caused. So if you spoke, you one one guy spoke. They wanted to throw him from third story building, um, and literally they dangled him to throw him. He was like thirteen years old, um, and and the trauma that it would have caused the guy. But that happened a lot to children with disabilities, and so uh, this is going to make some of the audience quite upset. Um, and I apologize for that. But when you go to a a, a country like that, um, they don't put much weight on towards human life um, and so if you've got a disability uh, you're a problem um, parents they mistreat you uh, because they have to hide you from the eye I'm not saying that for every for every family over there please don't take it wrong I'm saying that there was systematic abuse of people with disabilities that also and we're having now in Australia we're having a royal commission into disability for exactly the same things so it happens everywhere yeah. um, I don't want to marginalize a particular country or a nation it happens everywhere okay um, but it's happened more and it, I guess it stuck with me because I was young and so everything was being printed in my mind as, um, as I was forming what's right and what's wrong 
Yeah. And so you had to take sides because when you're a kid, there is no gray area. You either, there is either black, you either agree with, you know, you disagree or there is white, you agree. Um, my mom was a very strong uh, human rights advocate. Um, she was a teacher and, and I was coming home and explaining to her what was happening. She was telling me how to give advice to these kids, how I could. Um, anyway, none of, it, none of it worked. And so um, one kid was hung by his feet and, and um, it's called, it's a punishment called Bastida. Um, uh, which is where they um, put you, put your feet in a rope and they hang you and they can your soul, the soles of the feet. But what was happening is that as they came them, the, the head would, um, because their pain would jerk their body up and then they would hit their heads back on the ground really hard. So anyway, stuff like that. It was just like really brutal. I was like laughing from nervousness and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. I had that happen to me a few times. Um, had, Christ. you know, all of that. Had fingers broken, all of that crap. So... I I decided that I would um I would we would have to find a way because what was happening is that the punishment was being imposed on people who had speech impairments who couldn't spell like due to dyslexia and all that sort of stuff. Um so I decided that when to negotiate an outcome with a teacher at the time that every they picked on one kid every single there was like six seven subjects a day six seven teachers and every teacher would start with beating this kid up. And, and with, with canes and with, with, with sticks and I don't know, man, it was terrible. And this kid was in pain all the time. He didn't want to be home because he was abu- being abused at home. And, and, and he had an intellectual disability. I, I just thought, I said to her, look, um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take turns. You're going to leave this kid alone. But since you don't want to let, let it go, you want to hit him 30 times, there is, you know, 10, 15 of us. We will all take five each. How does that sound? Jesus. And and she would. And and then the next person would. And then the next person would. And but you know what? It united us. Believe me, it's so much better to be all equal than to be singled out mm. for punishment. Oh, yeah. And it feels so good. You you don't understand this. It feels good to be to bear the burden of your brother. Man, and and this is what I mean. Like that is that's it's such a unbelievable story that I really struggle to wrap my head around because I have nothing to relate to it as. But when I hear it, I go, now I see what you do in advice. And I mean, that just makes so much sense. And like, let's talk about if there's advisors out there and we all have large networks, um, what's the kind of client that they should be sending you whether it's their client or whether it's a family member of their client because one of the things i could imagine um is let's say you've got couple x and y and and uh they mention you know their brother or sister or something so this is even something i would imagine that would add a lot of value to your client's lives even if it's not them as an individual. Yeah. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's their kid. Well, their kid's the obvious one, but maybe it's their extended network. And so what's the kind of people who and other advisors should be sending you to to your platform? Um, uh, look, and, and, uh, I guess um, with the new FASIA code coming, um, there is a um, emphasis that you don't give advice on areas that you're not an expert in. Otherwise, you breach the code. Yeah. So you've got to not just do the right thing, but you've got to identify your own deficiencies and you've got to b- bring in the people who will um, bridge that gap. I'm happy to bridge the gap. There, I'm not sure how many people. If there are people who specialize in this, I think they should all kind of, um, when you when you submit this podcast, I think they should let themselves be known. Because sure. 20% of the Australian population has got a disability. Um, huge. Uh, huge. So we're not talking about William Johns wants to make a buck. We're talking about how can we have, how can we upskill ourselves? Yeah, how can advice do more? Right. How can, yeah. we, how can we upskill ourselves to, uh, to give more? Um, to bridge the gap. Totally, which which is what modern day advice is all about. It's like, right? what else can you add in? It, it, it is exactly. It's about what value yeah. can you add. Um, yes. So I've, I've I have advisors reaching out to me um, all the time, saying, "Hey, can I pick your brain on this? I've got this issue. What do I do here?" A lot of the time, it's about um, how to serve my client better. Yeah. Sometimes I say, eh, "Don't go there," um, because you've got capacity issues. 
Um, sometimes I say, if you do this, you're going to stuff it up. Um, so you need to go and get a lawyer. Yeah. You know, one of the things about one of the things I advocate is that you have to work as uh, in a, in a multidisciplinary way. So you can't just say, oh, this is my client. I want to make the profit out of them. Ooh, the other advisor is probably going to want my client. This is not a pro- how a professional thinks. You don't go to a GP who says, oh, look, I'll do the surgery myself because um, the the specialist is might going to take you and you'll never come back here again. Well, you've you've got a duty of care. So, um, and don't overestimate your own skills. So, for example, I am terrible, terrible at self-managed super funds. Um, and, and I'm very happy to admit it. And um, a lot of people are great at self-managed super funds. Yeah, Liam uh, Shaw. Yeah, well, everybody knows Liam. <laughs> um, yeah, Liam is Irish. Yes, Did he is. Did you know that? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he goes for the Irish teams. You know, yeah, one Australia absolutely. Plays. If you're listening to this, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> So he's built a brand. He's built a brand about being the self-managed super fun guy. Absolutely. Would I go to him? Of course I would. Yep. Would I refer my clients to him? Of course I would. Yep. Um, because he is an expert at what he does. Yes. Um, now, if you want to come and pick my brain, then do it. Um, but don't try to do stuff that's going to put you in trouble. Well, okay. So how, let's say I got a client who needs the help. What, how do I, what, what's the platform? What's the URL? What's going on? Yeah. So um, uh, claimright.com.au, the URL is being, so you'll go to a thing that says that the website is being updated. Cool. There is fixed for cost. There's an administration back office for anything disability related. Right. Um, so uh, an end-to-end disability support pension application to, to lodgement is 440. To go all the way to, you know, Centrelink is 770 or something. It's like cheap, yeah. but it could take nine, ten months of work. Yeah. And we've got three people who, one of them is, is uh, used to be a claims assessor at QSuper. The other one is, um, is, got a, uh, is doing a JD in law. She's already got a human rights degree, um, a law degree. Um, I've got another person who's got a master's in law. So these people are extremely smart, but they have a huge passion for human rights. Yeah. And I give them technical expertise like... Don't lodge it because there is an asset test issue. Go back to the advisor and tell the advisor that this is the issue. What do they suggest? William says that maybe you should put some money in super, um, but it's up to the advisor. The client doesn't see that interaction. We have a system whereby the advisor can be added onto the project so the advisor sees day-to-day what's going on. Um, all the interactions get recorded. The advisor has access so they can read what's going on. We do TPD claims. And so this is what actually... So a lot of the stuff what we do, we do is is um, a lot of people don't have 440. So yeah. we do it for nothing. Oh, man, come on. Well, we have to because what are we going to say? You're living in a caravan or you're homeless and you've got New Start giving you 250 bucks and we're going to take 240 from them, man. What are we, well, 440, what are we going to do? So you can't leave them on the streets either. So we do turtle and permanent disability stuff. That pays us 3,900 bucks. Um, the advisor then gives the, gives the advice. They can come and pick my brain on housing issues and all that sort of stuff, and does it, you know, and tax. How do you have enough hours in the day? Um, man, Seriously, you're you're like one of the most active person, active people. It, it, I know. it appears that way, man. I yeah. melt down just like everybody else. Um, you know, it, it comes at a big compromise uh, to lifestyle and so yeah. on. But there's too many people out there that need help and we've got a short life. And so we've got to do what we've got to do. And there's always people, as I saw on Facebook, who can park in your driveway and at least you get your, uh, <laughs> you get your irritation out of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and do you want to, do you want to, can I, can I share this with you, man? <laughs> Go on. All right. All right. All right. All right. So this is, I'm going to give this to you because this is, but you can't tell, you can't read the name because I've already been told I'm going to be sued. Oh. Um, so this is juicy, guys. This is like super <laughs> juicy. This is from a CEO of a super fund Woo. after I said, uh, after I, uh, I raised uh, hell. So if you want to know what, uh, what I'm, I'm like, um, this is, this is classic. This is, this is for them holding, uh, um, holy shit! I'm just wow. <laughs> right. Yep. Um. Sorry, man. I I just had to show you this because the person who just sent me a message is a really interesting character. Did you know I'm ninety um, percent of the way of picking? Uh, sorry, uh, booking in a, a podcast with them. 
Really? That's right. Ah, well, maybe I can help you. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm, that would be an interesting uh, thing. But let me just uh, get the CEO's uh, details out because this is quite funny. Um, sorry, guys. Just give me a second. There. Um, read this. Uh, 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 I think the audience ought to read what advocacy looks like when you're negotiating with super funds. Okay, so confirm the claim has been approved. Uh, sorry to see if there's been a delay. Oh wow, so they're yeah, but read the but read the at the end. Oh well, the process urgent resolve. I was made aware of uh, the comments. Oh, defamatory. Uh oh, serious risk. If you don't take action immediately. Please confirm immediately the reference personally. Oh, goodness gracious. So it's quite funny. When you do advocacy, you get around people the wrong way. And, yes. you, yeah, and, you, and you can't take a lot of hostages with you, right? So if people, but you've got to do it respectfully. Oh. You've got to take on the big guys for yeah. the small guy. Yeah. Um, they had the claim was there for months. Um, after I raised hell, um, it was nine in the morning. By three thirty, the claim was approved. These people have power. They have power to help people, yeah. and they need advisors. Man, advisors can do this. Man, give everyone your um, details because uh, I don't want to keep stealing all your time. Otherwise, I'm going to stay here forever, and we're going to yeah. end up at bloody that, no, that Korean barbecue again at ten yeah, o'clock. That was good, um, mate. How do people reach out to you? Yeah, um, if you want to send me an email, William at healthfinance.com.au. If you want to call me, one three hundred ten forty four ninety nine. If you press one, you'll get financial planning. If you press two, you will get claim right the back back office administration. Um, if you want to refer your clients, I promise you we will not give them financial advice. I'm not really interested in in, in um, making you look bad or making myself look bad. Totally. So, um, but we want to give you the support that you need to help vulnerable Australians. And uh, and of course, you're on LinkedIn. You're pretty active on there. I'm on LinkedIn. If you want to reach me on LinkedIn, just type William Johns. Um, yeah. And yeah, man. Um, and and and. To note, uh, you are the person to go to on the XY community as well for anything on this as well. So Yeah, yeah. Anything with special disability trials, yeah. anything disability really. I'm yeah. um, happy to help anybody for nothing. Dude, okay. you're a legend. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Awesome.